What's up guys, in this video we're going to continue our exploration of tensors. Here we'll be stepping through the code we developed last time with the debugger to see the exact transformations that are happening to our tensors in real time. So let's get to it. Last time we went through the process of writing the code to pre-process images for VGG16. Through that process, we gained exposure to working with tensors, transforming, and manipulating them. We're now going to step through these tensor operations with the debugger so that we can see these transformations occur in real time as we interact with our app. If you're not already familiar with using a debugger, don't worry, you'll still be able to follow. We'll first go through this process using the debugger in Visual Studio Code, then we'll demo the same process using the debugger built into the Chrome browser. We're here within our predict.js file within the click event for the predict button where all the preprocessing code is written. We're placing a breakpoint in our code where our first tensor is defined. Remember, this is where we're getting the selected image and transforming it into a tensor using tf.fromPixels. The expectation around this breakpoint is when we browse to our app, the model will load, we'll select an image, and click the predict button. Once we click predict, this click event will be triggered and we'll hit this breakpoint. When this happens, the code execution will be paused until we tell it to continue to the next step. This means that while we're paused, we can inspect the tensors we're working with and see how they look before and after any given operation. Let's see. We'll start our debugger in the top left of the window, which will launch our app in Chrome. All right, we can see our model is loading. Okay, the model's loaded. Let's select an image. Now let's click the predict button. And when we do this, we'll see our breakpoint will get hit and the app will pause. And here we go. Our code execution is now paused. We'll minimize the browser and expand our code window now since this is where we'll be debugging. We're currently paused at this line where we define our tensor object. We're going to click this step over icon, which will execute this code where we're defining tensor and we'll pause at the next step. Let's see. All right, we're now paused at the next step. Now that tensor has been defined, let's inspect it a bit. First, we have this variables panel over in the left where we can check out information about the variables in our app. And we can see our tensor variable is here in this list. Clicking tensor, we can see we have all types of information about this object. For example, we can see the D type is float32, the tensor is of rank 3, the shape is 224 by 224 by 3, and the size is 150,528. So we get a lot of information describing this guy. Additionally, in the debug console, we can play with this tensor further. For example, let's print it using the tensorflow.js print function. And we'll scroll up a bit, and we can see that this kind of lets us get a summary of the data contained in this tensor. Remember, we made this tensor have shape 224 by 224 by 3. So looking at this output, we can visualize this tensor as an object with 224 rows, each of which is 224 pixels across, and each of those pixels contains a red, green, and blue value. So what's selected here represents one of those 224 rows, and each one of these are one of the 224 pixels in this row. And each of these pixels contains first a red, then a green, then a blue value. So make sure you have a good grip on this idea so you can follow all the transformations this tensor is about to go through. All right, our debugger is paused on defining the mean ImageNet RGB object. Let's go ahead and step over this so that it gets defined. Again, we can now inspect this object over in the local variables panel. We're not doing any tensor operations here, so let's go ahead and move on. We're now paused on our list of rank one tensors called indices, which we'll make use of later. So let's execute this. We can see indices now shows up in our local variable panel. Let's inspect this one a bit from the debug console. If we just print out this list using console.log indices, we get back that this is an array with three things in it. We know that each element in this array is a tensor, so let's access one of them. Let's get the first tensor.
and it might help if we spell indices correctly. So let's try that again. We get back that this object is a tensor, and we can see what it looks like. Just a one-dimensional tensor with a single value zero. And we can easily do the same thing for the second and third elements in the list too. All right, we're going to minimize this panel on the left now and scroll up some in our code. We're now paused where we're defining the centered RGB object. And from last time, we know that's where the bulk of our tensor operations are occurring. So if we execute this block, then we'll skip over being able to inspect each of these transformations. So what we'll do is we'll stay paused here, but in the debugger console, we'll mimic each of these individual transformations one by one so we can see the before and after version of the tensor. So for example, we're first going to mimic what's happening here with the creation of the tensor that contains all the centered red values within our centered RGB object. In the console, we'll create this variable called red and set it equal to just the first call to tf.gather and see what it looks like. So we'll go ahead and copy this call and we'll create a variable red and set it equal to that. Before we do any other operations, let's see what this looks like. Let's first check the shape of red. Okay, 224 by 224 by one. So similar to what we saw from the original tensor of 224 by 224 by three, but rather than the last dimension containing all three pixel values, red, green, and blue, our new red tensor only contains the red pixel values. Let's print red and let's scroll up so that we can see the start of the tensor. And just to hit the point home, let's compare this to the original tensor. So the first three values in red are 56, 58, and 59. Now let's scroll up and check out the original tensor to see if this lines up. So 56, 58, 59, scrolling up to our original tensor, and yep, our original tensor has the red values of 56, 58, and 59 in the first three zeroth indices along the second axis. So red is just made up of each of these values. All right, let's scroll back down in our debug console and let's see what the next operation on red is. This is where we're centering each red value by subtracting the mean red value from ImageNet using the sub function. Let's make a new variable called centered red and mimic this operation. So we'll define centered red equal to red and then call the sub function. Now let's print centered red and scroll up to the top. Okay, so about minus 67, minus 65, and minus 64 for the first three values along the second axis. Let's compare this to the original red tensor now by scrolling up to look at that. And these are 56, 58, and 59 as the first three values along the second axis. So if we do the quick math of subtracting the mean red value of 123.68, and remember we can see that by looking here, 123.68 as our mean red value in the mean ImageNet RGB object, subtracting this number from the first three values of our original red tensor, we do indeed end up with the centered red values in the new centered red tensor we just looked at. Now, centered red still has the same shape as red, which recall is 224 by 224 by one. The next step is to reshape this tensor to be a rank one tensor of size 50,176. So we just want to bring all the centered red values together, which are currently each residing in their own individual tensors. So to mimic this reshape call, we'll make a new variable called reshaped red. So we'll scroll back down in our debugger console and we'll copy this reshape call. And we'll define reshaped red equal to centered red and then call reshape on that. All right, let's check the shape on this new object to get confirmation. And we see it is indeed the shape that we specified. Let's now look at the printout of reshaped red. Okay, and we see all the red values are now listed out here in this one dimensional tensor. All right, so that's it for getting all the centered red values. As mentioned last time, we go through the same process to gather all the blues and greens as well, so we're not going to go through that in the debugger. We'll now execute this block of code to create this centered RGB object and move on to the next step. This is where we're bringing our centered red, green, and blue values all together into a new processed tensor. 
So from the console, let's run this first stack operation by creating a variable called stacked tensor. So I'll create stacked tensor, set that equal to this stack call. Remember, we just saw that reshaped red ended up being a rank one tensor of shape 50,176. The green and blue tensors have the same shape and size. So when we stack them along axis one, we should now have a 50,176 by three tensor. You may think the result of the stack operation would look like this, where we have the centered red tensor with its 50,176 values stacked on top of the green tensor stacked on top of the blue tensor. And that's how it would look if we were stacking along axis zero. Because we're stacking along axis one though, we'll get something that looks like this, where we have 50,176 rows, each of which is made up of a single pixel with a red, green, and blue value. Let's check the shape now in the console to be sure we get the 50,176 by three we expect. Yep, we do. Let's also print it to get a visual. Okay, so we have 50,176 rows, each containing a red, green, and blue value. Now we need to reshape this guy to be of shape 224 by 224 by three before we can pass it to the model. So let's do that now with a new variable we'll call reshaped tensor. So we'll copy the reshape call from over here and define reshaped tensor equal to our stacked tensor dot reshape. Okay, let's print this reshape tensor and scroll up to the top. Again, this shape means we have 224 rows, each containing 224 pixels, which each contain a red, green, and blue value. Now we need to reverse the values in this tensor along the second axis from RGB to BGR for the reasons we mentioned last time. So we'll copy this reverse call here and we'll make a new object called reversed tensor and set that equal to our reshape tensor dot reverse. And we need to scroll down in our debug console and let's print this one out and scroll up to the top of it. Okay, so we see the first BGR values now let's scroll up to our last tensor to make sure this is the reverse of the RGB values we had there. So minus 99, minus 87, minus 67, scrolling up, we have minus 99, minus 87, minus 67. So indeed our new tensor has the reversed RGB values. Let's scroll back down in our debugger. And our last operation is expanding the dimensions of our tensor to make it go from rank three to a rank four tensor, which is what our model requires. So we'll create a new tensor called expanded tensor and set that equal to reverse tensor. And we'll copy the expand dim call from over here and call that on our reverse tensor. All right, now let's check the shape of this guy to make sure it's what we expect. So we have this inserted dimension at the start now, making our tensor rank four with shape one by 224 by 224 by three, rather than just 224 by 224 by three that we had last time. And if we print this out and scroll up to the start, we can see this extra dimension added around our previous tensor. And that sums up all the tensor operations. Quickly though, in case you're not using Visual Studio Code, I did want to also show this same setup directly within the Chrome browser so that you can do your debugging there instead if you'd prefer. In Chrome, we can right click on our page, click inspect, and then go to the sources tab. Here we have access to the source code for our app. PredictJS is currently being shown in the open window, so now we have access to the exact code we were displaying in Visual Studio Code and we can insert breakpoints here in the same way as well. Let's go ahead and put a breakpoint in the same place as we did earlier. Now let's select an image and click the predict button. We see that our app is paused at our breakpoint and then we can step over the code just as we saw earlier. And we have our variables all showing in this panel here. And we also have our console down here. 
So I can do indices zero dot print, for example, to get that same output that we got in Visual Studio Debugger. And from this console, I can run all the same code that we ran in Visual Studio Code as well. All right, hopefully now you have a decent grasp on tensors and tensor operations. Let me know what you thought of going through this practice in the debugger to see how the tensors changed over time with each operation, and I'll see you in the next video.